my job is to talk to you about clearing the cervical spine in trauma patients. And of course, we've been clearing the cervical spine for decades and we've been doing it with radiography. Radiography is a good study. It's a good way of going about this problem. It has an accuracy on the order, uh, sensitivity on the order of 94% and specificity of 95%. It's relatively inexpensive, 34 to $60, and medicine is, is really dirt cheap. Uh, it's available everywhere you go. You can't go to a center that sees trauma patients and not have availability to do radiography and, and somebody with some experience in interpreting it. So what's the problem? Why am I speaking to you about this today? And why is this something that we consider cutting edge? And why is it important? And the problem is that, that we're at Harborview Medical Center and we don't see patients like that one I showed you. The patients that we see uh, look like this. It's very difficult to even tell they have a spine because they have multiple injuries, because they're intubated, because they're on backboards, uh, because they have subcutaneous emphysema. So if we take cervical spine radiography on all patients, it's simple and straightforward. But if we start to look at high-risk patients, the patients who are most likely to be injured, we find that cervical spine radiography begins to fail. And it fails because it's difficult to perform. The backboard precludes us from adequately positioning the patient. The broken arm prevents us from doing a swimmer's view. The endotracheal tube prevents us from seeing the dens. The patients aren't cooperating with us because they're hypoxic or because they're uh, intoxicated. So we take a study that might require 10 minutes in a healthy patient, and it requires an hour. And even if we spend an hour on this study, we're often going to come up with inadequate or incomplete results. And we've looked at this. We've looked at how often we can clear the spine, at least radiographically clear the spine, in patients who do not have fracture. And overall, we have success about 96% of the time. But when you start to drill down and look at the patients who are most likely to be injured, our ability to clear the spine decreases. And if you look at high-risk patients with head injury, only about 89% of the time can we clear the spine. And if you have a head injury from a motor vehicle crash or a motorcycle crash, then your chances of being able to clear the spine, even if no fracture is present, goes down to 78 to 84%. So there's an alternative, and the alternative is to use CT to screen the cervical spine, to upfront perform a CT scan instead of using radiographs as the initial modality. And of course, we can get beautiful axial images. We can get sagittal reformats that give us the information we would get from a lateral radiograph and parasagittal reformats that give us beautiful detail of the facets. And finally, the coronal reformats are much like the open mouth. So in a sense, CT is analogous or superior to radiography. Now, how good is CT? Uh, this is data from our institution. We looked at sensitivity of CT scan for detecting fractures in trauma patients. This is a consecutive series of 601 patients. And what we find is the sensitivity is extremely high. It's 99%. And the specificity, meaning how often can we clear the spine in patients without fracture, even in high-risk subjects, is higher. It's on the order of 93%. This is our data from Harborview. There are similar series from Miami, from Mass General, from other institutions as well. And the data is very similar. About 99% of the sensitivity is about 99% everywhere you go. Good news about CT is it's easy. You can see the fracture from across the room. The second year med student looks at that and says it's broken, and that makes it simple. The other good news about CT is that you can almost always adequately evaluate the cervical spine. Now this is a human, this is an axial view of a, of a, of a cervical spine, but this 90-year-old lady is so kyphotic in her thoracic spine and so lordotic in her lumbar spine that we can actually visualize six different vertebral levels. And these are a challenge, and this is very difficult and her sagittal reformation is lousy. She's moving and she has no bone. But despite this, it's an adequate evaluation. We can diagnose the type 2 dense fracture, we can clear the rest of the spine, and we can move on. So how does radiography and CT compare? And that's really the question. And if you look at CT, it's more sensitive. It's more specific. It's quicker, because these patients are generally getting head CTs anyway, and we just scan through the spine. Um, but it costs more. It costs substantially more to do a CT than it does an X-ray. And it also involves much more radiation. So in a sense, we have to balance these two. We have to balance the cost and the radiation of CT versus the superior performance when compared to radiography. And the tool that we use here to make that decision is cost-effectiveness analysis. And cost-effectiveness is a term that people like to bandy about really loosely. But what I'm, the way I'm meaning it here is in the technical definition. And that is that we are making a central assumption that there's a limited pool of healthcare resources. There's a pot of money. And if we spend some of that pot of money on CT of the cervical spine in the ER, then there'll be less resources available for everything else, for vaccinations, for mammograms, for spine surgery, for anything else you can think of. 
So there's an opportunity cost, and what we need to determine is if it is worth it to spend the extra money on CT in the emergency department. We need to determine the value of the intervention. How much health do we buy by spending money on CT screening? And really what we're doing is we're comparing the different interventions. Money on CT screening versus money on something else and what turns out to be the best use of resources. The way we do this is with a modeling strategy, a decision analysis model where we determine all the possible outcomes that can occur. If a patient has a fracture, we may detect it or we may miss it. If we miss the fracture, the patient may very well be fine, or it may turn out to be an unstable fracture. It may progress, and the patient may end up with a neurologic deficit. Chances of that happening are very, very small. But we also look at the costs, and the costs and consequences of that missed injury with consequent neurologic deficit would be extremely high, high in terms of dollars and high in terms of patient outcome. So deriving this model, which is a theoretical construct that considers all those outcomes, then we have to figure out how likely each of the events are, and the likelihood is determined by the data we collect and by the literature. Now, if you go through this exercise, you find for CT screening that the results are counterintuitive. It turns out that if you can identify patients at high risk of injury, if you have a greater than 10% chance of fracture, then CT actually saves money. It's a more expensive test up front. When you look at the downstream costs, it's actually a cost-saving strategy. And it's cost saving for two reasons. First is because we have fewer inadequate studies, so we don't have to do an additional examination. And the second is that extreme cost of any missed injury. Only a very, very small percentage of patients will have, have a severe outcome, a neurologic compromise as a result of a missed injury. But the cost of those is astronomical. So from the slide I just showed you, in order to use imaging in a cost-effective manner, we need to figure out how likely you are to be injured. The cost effectiveness is dependent on the probability of fracture. So what we need is some way to look at a patient in the emergency department and say, this patient is at high risk and should get CT, or this patient is at low risk and should get X-ray. We need to define a high-risk group, in essence, based on clinical criteria. And that's the next stage in the process that we went through here to understand this problem, and that's to develop a clinical prediction rule to pick out the high-risk subjects. We do that by way of a case control study, 168 patients with fracture, uh, over a two-year period, some randomly selected controls, um, and excluding penetrating trauma. And what we found is that there are very simple to define clinical criteria that we can use. Focal neurologic deficit. If you're paralyzed, obviously you're at high risk of cervical spine fracture. If you have a head injury, meaning a severe head injury, unconscious uh, intracranial hematoma or skull fracture, that puts you at a greater than 10% risk of cervical spine fracture. Similarly, if you have a high energy mechanism, meaning high speed motor vehicle crash, fall from greater than 10 feet, pedestrian struck by a car, et cetera, these mechanisms put you at high risk of cervical spine fracture. So these are the criteria that we use to identify patients for cost effective use of CT. Now this is an exercise that I went through in my lab. I did this elaborate modeling strategy and came up with this clinical prediction rule and it's sort of a statistical exercise. And you out there looking at me should be somewhat skeptical because what goes on in my lab may not be what happens in real life. So anytime you have a clinical prediction rule, it needs to be validated. And that's the next step, is we look at how this actually works in practice. So we implement this strategy and then we see if we really are identifying appropriate high-risk patients and if we really are using our CT to clear the cervical spine in the correct manner. And what we found from a cohort over six months at Harborview is the patients that we select out as high risk are high risk. 12.8% of them actually had fractures, whereas the patients who were not, did not meet our criteria, did not get CT screening, are at very low risk. Only 0.2% of subjects who did not have a high risk criterion had actual injury. So the criteria are successful. We conclude that CT is accurate, it's rapid, it's effective, and it's cost effective if we can identify the appropriate patients. Finally, in patients who are at low risk or when CT is not available, then radiography remains the optimal strategy. Now the final component of this is the radiation issue. And radiation has been uh, much in the news and much talked about recently and I think appropriately. The CT that, technique that we use gives about three times the radiation dose of x-ray. So we want to use it with caution. We want to limit it to high risk patients. And that radiation is considered in the cost effectiveness equation, but we also want to take whatever steps we can to limit it. And one step we take is that we don't use CT at all to screen the cervical spine in children. Children have higher sensitivity to radiation, and they're at lower probability of fracture. So you can't identify high-risk group in children, and they're more sensitive. So we simply don't do it. And then we take some steps to lower the dose uh, 
varying the dose as you go through the spine than when you get into the shoulders where there's more tissue and you need a higher dose. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is pitfalls as we use CT to screen the cervical spine. And you guys are spine surgeons, you know how to read CTs of the spine. But what I will do is I will just run through the areas where injuries are missed. And there's really a few areas, it's fairly consistent. These are the things that get passed by. And the first is fractures of the dens. Fractures of the dens tend to occur in the axial plane, particularly type 2 dens fractures. The dens should be a solid round cortical plug. And if there's any disruption in that plug, that implies fracture and the sagittal reformats are going to help you. Sometimes the sagittal reformats, the fracture can be hard to see, but you have a little bit of soft tissue swelling and that's going to point your eye in the right direction. Second example, again, the fracture on the axial plane is subtle, but in the sagittal reformat it becomes straightforward. Second area of, of miss is fractures through, through the facets. These are simply uh, loosened Caesar lines oriented perpendicular to the normal plane of the facet. And the more I use CT to screen the cervical spine, and the more I look at these, the more impressed I am with the value of the parasagittal reformations. The default is everybody looks at the sagittal reformat to look at the alignment, but it's really the parasagittal reformat where you're getting critical information about the occipital joint as well as about the facets. Third area is end plates. End plates are hard. The fractures are hard to see because they may be subtle, and it's very hard to differentiate fracture from osteophyte. You have to determine if the margins are corticated. You have to rely on the sagittal reformats again in a magnified view uh, on this side. Um, sometimes in the case of end plate fractures, it's actually necessary to do x-rays because the spatial resolution on an x-ray is still better than it is on a CT scan. And, and the determination of whether this is corticated may be challenging on CT and we may actually use x-ray to, to problem solve. Final area is injuries to the craniocervical junction. And these are injuries which are not necessarily difficult to see, but we're not used to looking for them. We've always used x-ray to clear the spine. You can't see the craniocervical junction on x-ray, so you don't look at it. Now that we use CT to clear the spine, we're seeing occipital condyle fractures, for example, with much greater frequency, and we just need to be aware to look for them, and then they become straightforward. Uh, coronal reformats, again, useful to identify the uh, injury. Pitfalls on CT, the big one's motion artifact. I mentioned that we try to lower the dose by changing the technique as we get into the shoulders. That means there's an instantaneous pause. There's about a second pause as the CT uh, technique shifts. And if the patient shifts as the CT technique is changing, we'll get motion artifact. So is this an example of anterolisthesis at C4-5 with a fracture of the posterior elements? Well, it isn't because we see that same anterolisthesis extending through the nasogastric tube. So it's motion artifact. The companion case is uh, similar in appearance, anterolisthesis with a small posterior element fracture. But in this case, if you observe the soft tissues, they are straight. They're not affected by motion. So this is a true injury. Um, this uh, case here is something that we see now with multi-detector CT scan. We used to think about motion artifact is causing a shift, but now the scanning is so fast and because it's acquired volumetrically, instead of seeing a step-like shift, what we see is a wavy motion artifact. And this is a patient who has a rhythmic wavy motion artifact. And it's a wavy, a rhythmic wa wavy motion artifact because the patient's shivering. What we get is a shimmery effect through the spine um, that we can diagnose as shivering and we can generally see through it to check alignment. Finally, your spine surgeons, you're not radiologists, but sometimes you're going to be the ones in the middle of the night who are looking at these studies, so you need to function as a radiologist. And when you function as a radiologist, you have to look at the whole film. So you have to identify the right main stem bronchus intubation and the developing collapse of the right lung. And the more ominous cases, you need to identify the thickening of the area of epiglottic folds here in a patient who has a fracture of the thyroid cartilage and an airway that's imperiled. So thank you very much. What I'm really going to focus on is, is really my experience with anterior fixation of odontoid fractures in an elderly population.